All right, let's go ahead and get started for real. All right, so today we're going to be focusing on um, research ethics. We've already focused on kind of how do we make our studies meaningful by looking at, you know, how to create a good hypothesis, how to have good measures. Um, oh, just a reminder for pe people who've been, you've been assigned days to have your cameras on, so please make sure you do that because that's going to impact your grade if they're not on um, and it's your assigned day. Um, yeah, so we focused on how do we make sure our studies are meaningful by looking at, you know, how do we make a good hypothesis? How do we have good measures? Um, but today we're going to focus on another really key important part of designing a study, and that is research ethics. But before we jump into that, um, let's just do some basic housekeeping stuff. So I have the exam number one graded. Um, and you should be able to see, uh, maybe I didn't make them available, but um, if not, they'll be available after class to see your grade um, for exam number one. So the average was actually pretty good. It was a um, 59 out of 75, so basically like a 79%. Um, however, I noticed there were a couple questions and a 79% actually, is, it may sound low, but that's higher than typical semesters. Um, however, there was a couple questions that I noticed that a majority of people got wrong and I went look, you know, I look back at them and I'm like, I don't like these questions. So everyone received plus six points to their, their grade, bringing up the total, uh, the average grade to an 87. So good job on that. Um, you'll be able to see the answers for the essay questions. There's a, there's a uh, Word document up where you access the, the exam. And you can see the some suggested answers for the essay questions. Obviously, there's a wide range of answers that could be there. If you're not sure why you got points taken off on the essay questions, um, after you look at this answer sheet, come see me, and I'll be able to uh, explain it. Uh, the second thing is, so you're going to need to buy the SPSS base version um, by June 25th. You'll definitely need it for June 25th. Uh, this is something that I brought up at the very beginning of the semester. Um, see the syllabus for a link. I'll also include it in um, an email after class and then also next week. I advise not buying it just yet. Um, we're definitely going to need it for June 25th. So I would buy it sometime on the week of June 21st. So we'll have actually exam number two on that Monday. I would suggest buying it that week. Um, you buy the six month version, I think it's like $35. It's for six months and you'll be able to have it for 204 if you take 204 next semester and I advise taking 204 next semester. Assignments one and two are also graded. Um, feedback was provided for you if you didn't receive a 15 out of 15 on assignment number one, I believe. Yeah, assignment number one. Um, you can access it by going to uh, eCampus and going to the grade and you can see the feedback that I left on your Word document. Um, yeah, okay. And next up is the survey. So I went ahead and compiled all of your uh, group's questions in the two surveys. I have a, I'll send it out in an email afterwards, but I also have it uploaded to eCampus, but I have a little Word document that kind of has some instructions for you about this survey. Long story short, you're going to need to take both surveys, um, just so that way you can get credit for taking them. One thing to know is to make sure to put your name in the age question for both for both surveys. So like it'll ask you, what is your age? And just put your full name and then your age. This is just so that way I can give you credit for taking the surveys. But after you take the surveys, what I want you to do is post the link for your group on your social media platforms. So I believe there's you guys know more about social media than I do. I don't I don't use it, even though I study it. But I believe on things like Instagram or even Snapchat, you can like put links to things that way you just scroll up or they click on it and it takes them to the survey. Go ahead and do that. It worked really well in previous semesters where people were getting, you know, four students would put it up on their social medias that you'd get like 200 responses in a couple days. Um, so go ahead and do that. Oh, you only need to post your link. Uh, so let me show you actually what the survey looks like. Um, so can people see the Qualtrics survey that I, okay, cool. Um, so this is what the survey will look like. This is what your participants, if they're using a phone, it will look like on the right hand side, but this is what they'll see. This is essentially just a, a brief consent form, but let's just skip that. So they'll hit consent. Then they just have a couple demographic questions. So like, what is your gender? So I'll put, I'll put male. What is your age? So for you guys, you don't have to have your fam family and friends do this, just two or three students. 
either put your full name and then your age. I promise I, I don't care what answers you put. I'm not going to like, oh, what did, you know, what did this person say on their survey? I don't care about that. I just need it for give you a grade. Um, anyways, answer these questions. And then I uploaded all of the questions that you guys, that your groups came up with. And I put in the Qualtrics into a way that participants can fill out. Um, so they just have to answer, you know, a bunch of questions. It shouldn't take them that long. This one's the longest. I believe it's the social media one. This one's the longest. Anyways, but there we go. So it should only take them less than five minutes to do if they go through all the questions. And in a couple of weeks, we will have some data to analyze. Anyways, I uploaded a Word document and I'll send it out an email afterwards that says links for surveys. And it just has a couple steps for you to do that lists out everything that I just said. So if I went through it fast, don't worry, it's in that Word document. Does anyone have any questions about this survey or exam one SPSS stuff before we get started with the actual lecture? All right. So um, I know I put it up late, so hopefully you had a chance to look at the pre-lecture. If not, look at it after class. It just has some interesting information about unethical studies. But today we're going to be talking about research ethics. And I wanted to start off talking about, just very briefly, this Milgram's obedience experiment. Um, just by a show of hands with like the raise hand feature, how many people are familiar with this study? or have heard about it. All right, I'm seeing everyone, basically everyone on camera raise their hand, a couple people give thumbs up. Um, all right, so I'm not gonna go too much into it, but long story short, you know, the participants were told to um, shock someone if they gave an incorrect answer. Um, and the shocks got increasingly larger and larger and more intense as the study went along. And they were basically seeing how how far will participants listen to an authority figure? So if we had more time, I'd be like, so what are some problems with this? Well, I'm just gonna list off a few that I came up with. Um, you know, we were deceived, the, the, those participants were deceived. They weren't originally, you know, they weren't told what the study was purely, was, was about. And which is not necessarily a, necessarily a problem because a lot of studies involve deception, but this one, it was particularly bad because they were, you know, could have, the study could have invoked some psychological trauma, which is another um, unethical part about this study, is that there was a little bit of psychological trauma involved. It could, for some people, it could be traumatizing to think that you just shocked someone until they passed out, right? That you just get, you gave an electric shock to someone until they legitimately just passed out. So that could cause a little bit of trauma. And we don't want to give, we try to avoid giving trauma to psychology participants um, in psychological studies. So what today is going to be about is we're going to go over some guiding ethical principles. There's like five or seven of them. Um, and I think they're all pretty straightforward. They're all pretty logical things. So I'm going to go relatively fast through them as I do all things. But I think these things are going to be really easy to understand. Um, however, we're going to go over some definitions first. And then I'm going to go into how we actually put some of this stuff into practice in real psych studies. So first off, we need to have respect, respect for our participants. Um, this one is pretty obviously, this is just obvious, right? We need to respect people, not only because they are human beings, right? But they are also research participants and research participants are really the backbone of, of, all, of all social sciences, right? We need people to get data. So we need to treat them with respect. And in order to treat them with respect, these participants must be something that's called an autonomous agent. So what is an autonomous agent? This is someone who must be capable of making an informed decision to participate. And we'll get into what an informed decision is and who can make it. But you know, think about if we don't tell our participants what the study is going to be about, how can they make an informed decision about whether they want to participate or not? So we have to do something called an informed consent, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Participation must be voluntary. So this sounds like a no brainer, right? It's like, yeah, duh, we can't force people to take our, our studies, that's unethical. But it goes in a little bit deeper into that and we'll go into a little bit later about things like paying participants and maybe paying participants too much and why that's a bad thing. 
And then finally, participants must be treated with respect and dignity. Obviously, of course, they're human beings, but like I said, they are research participants and we do need them. The next two are something called, and I always, I always mispronounce this, but beneficence and non-maleficence. And what that means, beneficence means that we need to do good, that our research studies need to do good. And non-maleficence is we need to avoid doing harm to participants. So we really need to minimize any trauma or any harm or any potential risk that could come to participants. And we'll talk about who judges that, and it's called the Institutional Review Board in a couple slides. But something that every researcher has to do when creating a study and getting it approved is they have to do something called a risk benefit analysis. And this is where I write in a short paragraph, um, here's why my study is going to do more good than harm. And one question that students ask a lot is, well, you know, what harm is asking participants questions, right? A lot of psychological research is just, hey, take these surveys. And for some, for some people, harm can actually come from that. So here's an example from my own research. So in my dissertation, I'm gonna be asking people a bunch of questions six times a day for a week. And it's like 20 questions, six times a day for seven days. And one of those questions is going to be, how often do you find yourself comparing yourself to people who are better off? while looking at Instagram. And this is something that I talked about before, but it's called upward social comparisons, where you're comparing yourself to people who are better off than you. And this is bad. It's related to a whole bunch of negative outcomes for well-being, depression, anxiety, all that stuff. Well, one of the things that, one phenomena, I guess, if you want to call it is, if I keep on asking participants, hey, do you do this? Do you compare yourself to others? Do you compare yourself to others? And I do it you know, multiple times a day across the course of a week some people may be more likely to actually start doing what I'm talking about, you know, e even if it's not consciously. If it's just subconsciously, they just maybe just start comparing themselves to others. So there is a potential risk just by asking participants questions. An innocent question like, do you compare yourself to others, may actually start to cause participants to actually start comparing themselves to others. So before I do my study, I, I, you know, you have to write, here's why my study is better, or, or is, is beneficial, um, and here's how I'm minimizing risk. And it's called a risk benefit analysis. Um, but yeah, long story short, we wanna do the most good and the least amount of harm to participants. Another ethical principle is something called justice. And this is where participants need to be treated fairly and equitably. So all groups to which research might apply share benefits and risks equally. I think this makes more sense if I give you an example. Let's say I'm doing an experimental study on medicine and I give one group a placebo and I give another group some medicine that's going to, I, I don't know, cure depression or reduce depressive sim symptoms or something like that. And so people were treated fairly and equitably in that each one, if you're a participant, you have an equal chance of being in both groups, in either the placebo, placebo group or the good med or the medicine group, which is called the medicine group. And then, so right there, we treat the participants fairly, right? They have an equal chance of being in whatever group. But let's say after the study, we find out that this medicine does work, right? So we then also have to allow the participants in the placebo group, hey, do you want to use this medicine? Um, I think more in psychological research, let's get out of medicine. Let's say one group is do a control group and another group does three times a week, they have therapy, like a different type of therapy session. Um, that's more psych related rather than medicine. So after the study is done, we have to give the non, the, 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 the control group, the option, hey, do you want to take these therapy sessions? They sh they've been shown to be beneficial. You were part of a study. You were in the control group. You know, we, we want to help you. So here's some therapy sessions. And if you don't want to do these therapy sessions, here's some other options for you. So we need to treat our participants equally and fairly. Does anyone have any questions about the three or four that I've gone over so far? This justice, this idea of doing good and reducing harm and, and having respect for our participants. Like I said earlier, all this is pretty straightforward stuff that you probably are just like, well, yeah, duh, we have to do this. 
respecting our participants, doing good, reducing harm, and treating our participants fairly. All right, not seeing any questions. Let's move on to the, I think there's last two, maybe there's another slide after this. This idea of fidelity and responsibility. So as a psychologist, we have an ethical and a professional responsibility towards society. So we need to do research that is benefiting society. Um, so this means that, you know, we don't do a research study just for the sake of doing research. Oh, I'm curious. Let me just, you know, spend money and do this research because a lot of funding comes from the government, which is, you know, funded through taxpayers. So we need to actually do research that is beneficial to society. Just like doctors have a responsibility to help people, so do psychologists and, and psychological researchers. And then there's this other idea called integrity. Um, and this is made up of many different things, actually one of which we're gonna go into a little bit more um, later today in class with citations and plagiarism. But with integrity, psychologists need to promote accuracy, honesty, and truthfulness in their science. And what does this mean? So this means we need to have unbiased, accurate reporting of our research findings. So whenever you're reading research, and all of you have had to do this for you know, assignment number one, and you will have to do continue doing it for your papers. But I'd assume, like me, we're just you're just like, okay, I'm taking this at face value. I'm assuming that they analyze the data correctly, that they aren't lying, that you know they're being truthful. And so this is something that you just have to trust of other researchers, but it is one of these guiding ethical principles of researchers should have integrity. Another idea of integrity is crediting other researchers' ideas appropriately. So this comes into things like plagiarism. Um, all research is based off of prior research and you need to give credit to that prior research. Think about your introductions where all the introductions that you read in, um, in manuscripts, they're all citing previous work. You're all giving credit to previous work. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is the ever exciting topic of plagiarism and how to do citations. <coughs> Excuse me, but yeah, this falls under integrity. Um, oh, uh, this last one is actually something that's relatively recent. Um, it's this idea of making data available for inspection, reanalysis, and replication. So one of the things that a lot of journals are doing, and I think it's great, is they are making it so that you, if I want to submit to a journal, I have to provide my data set. That way, if people are like, if people want to, they can download that data set and rerun the same exact analyses that I ran to confirm that, hey, he's not lying. And they did find the findings that they're, that they are reporting. So this is something that's relatively recent. Um, and I think a lot of journals from here on out are going to make this mandatory. All right, so these were the, I believe, five guiding ethical principles. But next, let's talk about actually putting them in practice. So how are these guiding ethical principles actually done in the real world? So first off, we have to talk about, you know, who determines what is ethical? And that's something that's called the Institutional Review Board. And I'll refer to it from here on out as the IRB. So the IRB is a group of people that reviews all research protocols involving, it says human participants, but they do them for animal participants as well. So just any research that involves participants needs to get approved by the IRB. And what the IRB does is it checks for adherence to ethical standards and determines the level of risk and it essentially just makes sure that your research is ethical. So who makes up the IRB? So the IRB is at every institution. Um, so at every college has one. Every place that does research, psychological research, has should have one. Um, and the IRB is typically made up of professors from all different areas um who are involved with research and you know occasionally even community members um maybe not so much at colleges but maybe at private ins or not private institutions like at research companies maybe made up of the community but essentially it's a bunch of people who know about research um who are you know faculty members or whatever and they look at your your research study and they say is it ethical 
And they typically, you have to submit this in order to do a study. And typically you get feedback back saying, you need to make these changes, or you know, did you think about this, or X, Y, and Z, and then you have to fix them, submit it back, it's a long process, and then you can do your research study once they approve it. This final point is that it, as a researcher, I have to adhere by what the IRB says. So I submit to the IRB in this application to do research, I'll submit, here's everything a participant will see. Here's all the measures I'm going to ask. Here's exactly if I'm doing an experimental study where you know participants have to come to a lab. Here is step by step everything that will be done, and it is my job once it gets approved is that I have to stick to that protocol. It is a responsibility of the principal investigator, me as the lead researcher. I have to stick to that protocol, and anytime you want to make a change to that protocol, let's say, oh, I forgot, I want to ask participants, you know, this question about their gender or whatever. And anytime you make a change, you have to get it approved by the IRB. So they really are this overarching group of people that determines that your study is ethical and you have to listen to them. So that is the IRB in a nutshell. So there's some other things that we do to ensure that our study is ethical. So the first thing is something that's called an informed consent. So what this is, is that participant is given information that might affect their willingness to participate before the study begins. So essentially, um, in this last study I was involved with, it was like a three-page document where we, we told participants very roughly, here's what the study is about. We didn't tell them everything, like what we were hypothesizing, but we did tell them, hey, we're going to be looking at the relationship that parents have with their kids and a little bit more information, but we didn't tell them the, the full scale of the study. We told them some things that, you know, that they all have to do. You'll have to answer some surveys. There's going to be like a breath holding task where we ask you to hold your breath. Um, there's going to be a, a interaction task where you work with your kid on the etch a sketch together and a couple other things. And then we tell them, hey, here's what you should expect from us. All your data will remain anonymous. Um, any videos that we have of you will be kept in a locked um, folder locked away in our lab um, and some other things and then they sign the, the piece of paper and then we sign the piece of paper and it's not that it's like a legally binding agreement but it is an agreement between the participant that they consent to participate however they can stop at any point but also that hey we will follow these rules that we have approved by the IRB to protect you as a participant so this informed consent really is just a form that says, that tells the participant, here's what's going to be expected of you. Um, here's what you're going to have to do, what you may see. Do you agree to participate? Yes or no? They say yes, we can continue on with the study. If they say no, we end it right there and we say, you know, thank you for coming in or whatever, um, and they're free to go. Well, they're always free to go. That was poor wording. They're always free to go, but, you know, they don't have to take the study. There are some exemptions from an informed consent. So observational studies of public behavior. Let's say you wanted to go to the corner of High Street and um, you wanted to see how many people are on their phone while they're driving at a red light. You don't have to get consent from these people because you are just observing them in public. If there's no expectation of privacy, AKA you're observing people out in the public, you don't need to get their consent. Also, if there's minimal risk anonymous survey research, you don't need consent in that either. So think about um, the research study that we're doing as a class. Tech, even though I have that question in the very beginning saying like, do you agree to consent? Technically, I wouldn't even have to ask that because it's really low risk research. We're just asking a couple questions and the questions really aren't that bad. Think about if you were to go out to Kroger and you wanted to do a study, I don't know, um, seeing if, if people who spend longer on their phone in Kroger spend less money or something, I don't know, something weird like that, something really simple. And you just stood outside the exit of Kroger and said, hey, would you like to be in a research study? How long were you in your phone while you're in Kroger? And how much did you spend? How much you know, does your receipt say? Once again, there's really minimal risk. You're not asking for their name. Um, you're not identifying them in any way. You don't need to ask them for consent. Obviously, you probably want to ask them, hey, do you want to do this research study? It's two or three questions. You don't just go up to them and start asking questions, but you don't need to get like a signed consent form. 
There's a problem with this though, in studies that involve deception. So like I said in the begin or in the informed consent slide is the informed consent really is a form that says, hey, here is what you're gonna be doing in this study. Well, what happens if you're lying to participants? You can't tell them that you're gonna to lie to them, right? That defeats the purpose of deception. So this is where things get a little sticky. Um, because this obviously deception is allowed. There are some cases where deception is maybe needed. So think about if you were doing a study where you wanted to know if you wanted to look at uh, recall, like memory recall, how well participants remember something, but you don't want to let the no, you don't want to let the participants know that they're doing a memory test because that may that may influence like, oh, okay, now I really got to study these words because I'm going to have to recall them later. Because think about it, that's a, that's a pretty common undergrad science study or a psychological study where you say, hey, we're going to have you memorize these words. Then we're going to give you some math tests to distract you after you remember these words. And then we're going to see how long, how many words you can remember. Well, let's say we just wanted to know how many words do participants remember when we don't tell them that they have to remember those words. So we give them a, a, a paragraph to read and then um, give them a math test or whatever. And then we ask them, hey, how many of these words did you read in that paragraph? So we're looking at memory at just like a memory that, I don't know how to put this in words, but we're looking at memory that the participants don't know that they have to memorize something. So it's just this basic memory. It's really weirdly worded, but hopefully you get the point of what I'm trying to say there. We need to lie to the participants. So deception is permitted if and only if these criteria are fulfilled. So first off, the scientific question could not be answered without deception, which is kind of like my example. If we want to look at how much someone can remember when they don't re realize that they have to remember these things, we can't answer that without doing deception. You can only use deception if there's no reasonable expectation of harm, right? If we're not going to be harming the participants. Um, then you're allowed to lie to them. It wouldn't be right if we were just like, no, the study is you just answering a couple questions and then we threw them into the Milgram experience where they're shocking people and there could be psychological trauma. Can't do that. And then finally, if you lie to someone or if you, I don't like the word lie, if you deceive someone in a research study, um, you have to fully inform them as soon as possible. So typically after the research study is done, um, after, the, after the participant is done, you say, oh, hey, what we were actually studying is X, Y, and Z. We told you this, but we are actually studying that. So we need to fully inform participants afterwards. So deception is allowed if and only if these, these three criteria are fulfilled. So let's talk about voluntary participation and how convoluted it is. So we will need to make sure that participants are not pressured into participating or pressured into continued participation. And so one way that we encourage participants or we try to get participants is we pay them, right? Or we give you extra credit in, in classes. But incentives to participate cannot be excessive because it may pressure people into participating. So here's an example of this. So let's say I'm doing a research study where I'm just asking some questions, right? And it takes about half an hour. Decent compensation for that would be about $10. Now, let's say I would offer $200 or let's say $500 to take this 30 minute survey. Would you just, this is a rhetorical question. You don't need to type it out or anything. Just think about how many people, if they were offered $500 to do a psychological study that only takes an hour, I bet you a majority of you would probably do it because we are all poor college students or majority of us are poor college students who might feel pressured to take us to do a study if enough money was offered. Um, you know, think about let's go to the homeless encampments in Morgantown and let's offer them, you know, a thousand dollars to do a medical experiment. I bet you every single one would do it. And so is it really, are we, it gets into the question of, well, are you pressuring them? Yeah, if incentives are too large, participants can feel pressured to participate or continued participation. So there's some special populations where this really comes into play. 
Think about patients at a hospital. If you're in a hospital and let's say you're, you have an extended stay, you're staying you know, overnight or whatever, and a doctor comes to you and says, you know, hey, would you um, be interested in doing this research study I'm doing? Some people may feel pressured into saying yes because they don't want to anger their doctor or they think if they don't do it, you know, the doctor might overlook them in other, in, in, in other medical ways. Um, so they may feel pressured. Prisoners. If you're doing re and research happens quite frequently in prisons, um, prisoners may feel pressured to participate in research studies because they don't want to make their warden mad. And maybe the, you know, maybe they think that the warden will not, you know, will punish them in some way. Children, children cannot consent to, to doing a research study without uh, parent permission um, because just because they're under, the, under the age of 18. And, and children may be more likely to do research studies for, I don't know, for a lollipop. Um, and, that's just, and that's just not right, right? The, the incentives can't be too excessive, but you know, they have to be um, good enough. A lollipop, probably not good enough. And then students. So this is a really interesting one. So students are often offered extra credit to do research studies. So if you took this class during the fall or spring, um, there would be an option for you to get extra credit by taking research studies. And some students may feel pressured into doing this extra credit research studies um, because they're like, oh, if I don't do it, I'm going to fail the class. Or, you know, I need these extra 20 points to um, the otherwise I'm, you know, I'm not going to do well in class. So there, you know, we, there is some coercion going on. Um, and for, for, for students to get extra credit by taking research studies. So at all institutions, or it should be at all institutions, and every class that offers extra credit by taking research studies, you also have to ask um, or offer extra credit in other ways. So I know this class has like, you can do um, an article summary, essentially, and get the same amount of extra credit. Um, so there's always opportunities to get extra credit that aren't as a result of doing a research study, because we don't want to um, pressure you into doing research. I know some universities got in trouble because they actually made it a requirement of like Psych 101 that you have to you have to partake in research studies. That you know that's that goes beyond pressuring. We're telling them you have to do it. That is not voluntary. So I went off on a little tangent there, um, but yeah, participants can't be pressured, and they should be able to be able to stop at any time. Finally, I think there's two more. So we're talking about private privacy confidential and confidentiality. So participants have the right to privacy. Um, we never typically ask for names in, in psych research, right? I never I am asking you your name for the purposes of giving you credit in your surveys, but typically research never asks for, for, for participants' names. Research results should always be treated with confidentiality and with anonymity whenever possible. So um, sometimes you have to give or you have to put an identifier on data. So what do I mean by this? So let's say I'm doing a longitudinal study where I'm going to ask participants over the course of a year, you know, a bunch of surveys. And I have to obviously link up their first survey with their fifth survey. So typically what we do is we ask them for their name. And you know they put their name in, and then immediately once we download the data, we find out okay this participant you know his name is Jeff and he's actually participant 476. So then instead of their name on the data, we just put 476. So that is a way to make it anonymous or and, and confidential. So their name is never associated with their data. Uh, and then the IRB has like specific procedures. Not going to go too much into it, but essentially, you know, if I have an Excel spreadsheet with everyone's name, it has to be locked. The Excel has to be locked with a password and a password protected folder. There's a whole bunch of things that the IRB has to ensure um, that participants are participants' data remain confidential. Pretty straightforward. Uh, okay, a uh, couple more protection from harm. Um, the IRB categorizes studies as no risk, minimal risk, or greater than minimal risk. Uh, minimal risk is just comparable to risk encountered in everyday life, is what it is. Most research is not greater than minimal risk. Most research is just minimal risk or no risk. 
Um, think about the example of minimal risk is that my dissertation idea of people maybe comparing themselves after being asked the question so many times, that is minimal risk. And maybe I'll have to have safeguards against that. At the end of the study, I tell participants, hey, here's what I was doing. And maybe here's some resources like the Caruth Center, some mental health resources if you need to seek anything out. And then I think this is finally the debriefing. So debriefing typically occurs after every research study, not just ones that involve deception. Um, basically, after the, re after the study is done, you just tell participants, hey, here's exactly what the experiment was about. Any mis misconceptions, if we deceived anyone, must be cleared up. We answer any questions the participants may have. Um, if any harm came to the participant, all reasonable steps must be taken to correct it. Doesn't happen a lot in just survey, actually doesn't really happen ever in survey research, but maybe this is more important to, I know the Melissa Blank lab actually has like participants smoke e-cigs and cigarettes. Um, so maybe, you know, it, she offers some support after, after the study is done. But yeah, debriefing, always tell the participants about the study after they take it. All right. Okay. So does anyone have any questions? That ends the ethics part of the class. Does anyone have any questions about anything that I talked about today? I think it's pretty straightforward, pretty common sense stuff. Um, if you saw this one in an exam, you know, and I, and I gave you an example of a study, or you know, some information about a study, uh, one of the questions I may ask you is like, hey, what is the problem with this? What is the ethical problem with this information I just gave you? And you'd have to identify, oh, um, you, you, didn't, you lied to participants, but you didn't tell them that you lied afterwards and what the true nature of the study was. Like that would be one of the multiple choice answers. Um, so just know these, I think what, I, there's five ethical guiding ethical principles. So know them and then know how researchers actually apply them in the real world, which was the second part of this lecture. Taylor, do you have a question or is your hand thing raised just from uh, like 15 minutes ago? Okay, that answers that. All right, so next up, let's talk about another absolutely riveting topic and that is writing with citations and avoiding plagiarism. Something that we have to do because this is a speak right course. It's just a term from the university. Have to go through it. Um, so yeah, let's just knock it out. So what is plagiarism? I'm assuming all of you know what plagiarism is, but it's passing off someone else's work or even your own previous work as original. Um, some examples of plagiarism, turning in someone else's work as your own, using someone else's ideas without giving credit. Um, if you're gonna use exact wording, use quotes and the appropriate citation afterwards. Patch writing, this is actually something that's really common in undergrads. Um, so please make sure you don't do this, but this is essentially changing words, but copying the same exact sentence structure. So it would be like taking, you're like, oh, I like these this pair, this three sentences from this article. Let me just copy paste these three sentences and change a couple words synonym, like, um, with, with synonyms. Um, yeah, that's, that's called patch writing. It is a form of plagiarism. Uh, giving incorrect information in a citation so readers can't find a source, another example of plagiarism. Even if it's tempting, don't do it. Um, I think I said in the very beginning of class, but everything you, most, all the writing that you'll turn in for this course and for a lot of university courses goes through something called Turn It In. And what it, what it is, is it, it will show me your paper with a bunch of highlights on it saying, hey, here's wording from a similar source. So if you copy a paragraph, I'll, you know, with a click of a button, I'll know it. Um, please don't plagiarize. I don't want to have to write people up for plagiarism. It's not fun for me, nor fun for you. Um, so don't do it. If you ever have any, and I, I'll say this a couple of times, but if you ever have any questions about, oh, how do I word this? Or how do I cite it? Please email me or come see me. I would much rather sit with you and help you than have to write you up for plagiarism. So, okay, avoiding plagiarism. In scientific writing, we frequently, pre uh, give ideas that are not our own. Um, like I said, think back to the introduction, all of that is citing previous work and building off previous work. All good research studies are based off of previous findings. 
So to avoid plagiarism, be sure to present the ideas in your own words. So don't even be like, oh, I like this paragraph. Let me copy it and change a couple words. Just read the paragraph and then write, you know, go to your paper and then rewrite it in your own words without looking at the original source if you feel like you're going to be tempted to just copy paste. So to avoid plagiarism, write it in your own words. And this is another important part that we'll talk about today is including appropriate citations, both in text and in the reference page. Uh, know how to paraphrase. Okay, so um, yeah, this is a skill that takes a little bit of, it takes a lot of writing to really become good at paraphrasing. But essentially, this is just you know reading a reading a paper, reading a paragraph, reading whatever, and being able to restate those findings in your own words. Uh, you have to change both the words, obviously, and the sentence structure. So, like I said, don't just copy and paste a paragraph and change out a couple words. That's still plagiarism. You also so you need to know how to paraphrase. You need to make it clear whose ideas you are presenting. So here are some ways to do that within text. You can say you know the author suggested that blah, 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 blah. And then you, you know, you have an in-text citation with the author's names in the year. So you could say the author suggested that this, this study indicates that blah, 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 blah. Smith and Jones, so you actually state the author's names, found that. Don't overuse this one. This is really low quality writing is whenever you start off with the, the uh, author's names. And here's the reason for this. So one, it's just bad sentence structure, but in psychological research, we don't care who the authors are. We don't care who, who what researchers did the research. We just care about the findings. So we, you know, so starting off with like Smith and Jones found that grammatically, or you know, going back to English class, it makes it sound like the main point of this sentence is this Smith and Jones idea. And we actually, we don't care about Smith and Jones. They're just there as citations. So that way we can go back to the previous source if we want to. So that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why you never really want to start off with the author's names because we don't care about the authors. Like I say here, if you're not sure, ask me. Um, we're going to go into how to do in-text citations as well as reference page, but at any point, if you're not sure, whenever you're writing your own work, ask me and I will. I would love to help. So the next couple of slides are some examples of plagiarism. I'm going to start off with a severe example, and then we're going to go and look at some non-severe examples, but that are they are still plagiarism. So this is from my own work, but here's here. So this is from the original source. This the sentence right here. Mothers who reported having more depressive symptoms had children who perceived their relationship as less secure, which in turn predicted children having more depressive symptoms. So here's some examples of plagiarized versions. So one, I just straight up copy and pasted this sentence into my own work, obviously a form of plagiarism. But two, here I just did it again, but I cited it. So I give the actual correct in-text citation. It's still plagiarism because I still just copied it word for word. So it doesn't matter if I cite it, it's a, it, as, because I copied all, you know, just copied the sentence and pasted it, it's still plagiarism. The citation won't save you. So here is, so, so if you're going to do a direct, so there's, you can use a direct quote. So you can copy and paste. And I'm going to advise that you don't do this in your own papers because there's really never a need to use a direct quote. Hopefully you're familiar with the difference between a direct quote and paraphrasing. Kind of, kind of going to go over today, but this should have came up in something like high school or maybe even middle school. But let's say I wanted to just, I like this sentence, and there's, this is the only way to say that sentence. So you know, I could say, according to Hughes and colleagues, I provide the direct quote in quotations, and then I give the page number that it was on. So that is one way to do a direct quote. Here's another way: instead of starting off with "according to Hughes and colleagues," which is like we talked about a bad way to start. You could say the authors concluded or, you know, the research suggests that I give the direct quote and then I give the citation at the end, Hughes et al, 2020, and then the page number. So this is a, you can copy and paste as long as you use direct quotes, 
So quotation marks and give the proper citation. But if I see this in your work, I'm going to say, hey, don't use direct quotes here. Rephrase this. Because direct quotes are only ever to be used if you can't like rephrase something, right? If you can't, if this is the, if there's only one way to say it and that's how the researcher said it. So maybe a definition of something, maybe um, like a very specific definition, um, then you could use a direct quote, but typically what you want to do is paraphrase. So let's go into the paraphrase version. So once again, up top, we have the, the, the original source, but there's different ways to paraphrase it. So this is just one way, but in my own words, I say, hey, the findings suggest that mothers who are depressed may be more likely to have children who are depressed. This may be a, a result of the impaired mother-child relationships as a result of maternal depression. So that's essentially what this sentence said, but in my own words. And then I give the correct in-text citation. So like it says here, paraphrasing is preferred to direct quotes. Um, direct quotes should only be used when absolutely essential. And in most of your writing, it will never be absolutely essential. You can always rephrase something because we want to see your writing style and thoughts. I don't care about what other people have said. I want to know how you interpret it. Any questions right now about direct quoting, paraphrasing? Hopefully this is all review. This is stuff that people go over in high school, but I am I have to go through it in this class. So we got to just struggle through it for today. All right. So next up, the next portion is going to be about actual citations. So we have two, the essential components of two, two things, the in-text citation and the reference page. Um, how many people have ever done, using the raise hand feature, thumbs up thing again, how many people have done in-text citations and an APA reference page? All right, cool, great. This is, okay, awesome. So I'm going to go through this relatively fast, um, but I can go over it individually if you if people need it. There's something called an in-text citation where this is in your paper and you are citing the source when you present the idea and you always use the, the author's last names and the date of publication. And then you have at the very end of your paper something called a reference page, which is a full list of all, this, all the research that you cited in your paper. It's presented on its own page at the end of the paper and includes all the information that we'll get into. All right, so for in-text citations, there are two, well, there's a couple of different types of in-text citations and it determines how many authors are in the paper that you're citing. So if there's only one to two authors in whatever source they're using, you can do a couple of different types of citations. So you should limit this for the reasons that we talked about before, but you can put the author's names in the beginning, Hill and Roberts in parentheses, the date stated, blah, 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 whatever they found. Once again, the author's name, the author's la last names, and the year. If there's only one, just obviously the author's last name and the year. All right, so one to two authors, pretty straightforward. So that's at the beginning of the sentence. At the end of the sentence, which is how hopefully all your writing should be, and I'll help you get there in feedback. But at the end of the sentence, you just in parentheses, you know, you have your paraphrased whatever you're writing. And at the end of the sentence, author's last names, using the and sign, not A-N-D, the actual ampersand sign, and then the year. Author's last name and year. Pretty straightforward. If you're including a direct quote, there's an example of it back here. If you're having a direct quote, author's last name. So this is more than uh, two authors, and I'll get into that in the next slide. But um, you need to include the author's last names, the year, and then the page number that it is on if you are doing a direct quote. But once again, avoid using direct quotes. All right, so if there's, so that was one to two authors. If there's more than three authors, it's slightly different. You use at all or phrasing like and colleagues. So once again, don't use it too much at the, front, at the front of the sentence, but if you have more than three authors, you can say things like Hughes and colleagues or Hughes at all 2020 stated. Or if it's at the end of the sentence, which as it should be, you have, you know, whatever sentence that you're writing. And then at the very end, you have Hughes et al period, comma, and then the year and parentheses. Pretty straightforward. It sounds like all of you have been experienced some version of this before or have done it before. So if you need to come back whenever you're doing citations and look at these as you're writing, feel free to. Um, yeah, so here's actually another example that 
I do a lot in my own writing. But let's say you're using multiple citations to establish an accepted fact. So let's say I want to say that oh, I present the idea in my writing that increased social media use has been associated with depression in several age groups. Well, there are hundreds of research studies that say social media is related to depression. So let me just cite a few big ones. And if you're doing social media research, these aren't real citations, so don't look at these um, for your own research. But notice that if I'm citing multiple sources for an established fact, that I still follow the same rules any other that I present any other slide. So if there's one or two authors, it's just the author last name and then a year. If it's more than three authors, you use the first author's last name at all then a year. But another thing to notice is all of these are in alphabetical order. So this is another key part. If you're citing multiple studies in one like citation, put them in alphabetical order of the of the first author's last name. So we start with Aaron, then we have B, and then we have C. Note the citations are given in alphabetical order. So if you're citing more than one study for, for a fact, this is how you do it. Should say it's not necessary in your own writing that you have to do this, but if you come across an opportunity to do it, here's how you do it. All right, let's go jump into the reference page. Um, this is where you just include all the sources that you cited in your paper. Uh, it's arranged alphabetically by the author's first name and then use proper APA format. So let's jump into what is proper APA reference page format. Um, I'm also going to show you a really easy way to do this using the EBSCO host. That's one of the reasons why I suggest using EBSCO host to find your research, because you can just use the site feature on that um, on that website, and I'll show you how to do that. But here's what a citation is made up of. And I'm not going to go through all these small little things. I suggest coming back and looking at, looking at this if you want. Um, but we have the author. So this looks like it has, it has two authors. Actually, one of them is a professor here, Nick Turiano. But we have two authors. So we have the first author's last name, comma, and then you have the first and middle initial. After each initial, there is a period and a space, then the next initial. After the first author's after each author's first initial, there's a comma. Then if there's, this only has two. So if there was like three authors, then you, would, you wouldn't have this and sign. You would have just the author's next, the next author's name, then a comma, then an and. Um, so you don't need an and after every author's last, after every author, just if there's, just for the last one. It, you'll see it, I'll show you another example, it'll make more sense. But then we have the date of the publication then we have the article title. Only the first letter of the article title gets capitalized, um, unless there's like proper nouns like US. And then you end the title with a period. Then finally, you have, or not finally, but you have the journal title in italics. Then you have the journal volume number and the issue number. The journal volume number is in italics, in parentheses is the issue number and not italics, comma, page numbers, period, you can't see the period there, but there is a period after that page number. And then you have the DOI. Um, the DOI is really just a, it, it's a link that takes you directly to the journal with the research article. Um, but don't read too much into this. I'm going to show you the EBSCO host way of doing it that just outputs it for you. But there are some slight changes that you'll have to make. So this is what a reference page should look like. At the top centered, you should have the word references. Then you have all the references in alphabetical order. Um, notice that they are indented. So the second, any line after the first line for one citation is indented. I'll show you how to do that in Word. All right, so let me, um, there's a couple things here where I'm like, hey, fix the citation. Let me skip through these for right now. Okay, let me show you an EBSCO host how to do this because I think this will make your life a lot easier. All right, so, um, here, I just searched for an article and I found one on social media. And so this is what, you know, you look at EBSCOhost, once you click on an article, you know, this is what it looks like. So one of the really cool features of EBSCOhost is this cite feature on the right-hand side. So what you can do is for every article you have on EBSCOhost, you can click cite. It'll take a couple, can I click it? Oh, there we go. Let me take a couple of it takes a couple of seconds. Okay. So then what you can see here in this, um, it gives you a bunch of different citations. Oh, no. All right. Let me go forward. Cite. Accidentally clicked back. 
Um, what you need to do is you need to find the APA 7 one. It's like three or four down. We see we have like the medical association citation. Oh, it's the third one down, maybe different. But anyways, it says APA 7th edition. So what you can do is you can just copy it. Let me go ahead and copy it. And paste it. So yeah, let me just do that. So I went ahead and pasted it. Let's say this is my reference page. And you see it pasted it in a weird, not a weird way, but it, this isn't proper APA format. So let me go ahead and let me just unbolt it. All right, so let me go ahead and put it into APA format. So there's some things that we're gonna have to do, some small things. Let me just go through, we can see the names look all okay. Everything's capitalized, it should be capitalized. There's the date. Only the first word is capitalized in this title. Oh, okay, here's the first thing that we'll have to change. The journal title and the volume number is not italicized. So let me just make it italicized. Page numbers. And then here, th this one you'll have to change for every WVU EBSCO host citation that you do, you will have to change this. And I will take points off for this on your on your paper if or on your citation um, if it's if this isn't changed. So let me put on its own uh, line. So you see how it says HTTPS, blah, 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 DUI dash or dot WVU dot IDM, all this like all this stuff right here. This isn't helpful. Um, if I wanted to go to your reference page and like look at this source, um, I would have to like log into WVU in order to look at it. So let's get rid of this. How you do this is you just do doi.org slash. So just delete that WVU stuff and just do doi.org do doi slash. It's what it says in the PowerPoint. Um, so, you know, if you don't remember that, just go back to that PowerPoint and look, but you do have to change this WVU stuff just to say doi.org slash. All right, so there's some other things I have to do to this. So first off, it needs to be doubled, not single spaced. And then also I talked about that indentation. So I don't know how to do this on Google Docs. I think it might be the same way. Um, but if you're using Word, and I suggest everyone use Word, it's free through the university, what you can do is just highlight it. And then up here on this, can I make it just single page? There we go. So up here on this, um, I think it's called a ruler in uh, in Word. All I got to do is change this bottom one. Oh, finicky. Let me put that back. Right, there we go. Highlight it. Change this. Half indent. There we go. It's indented. This is proper APA format. This would get you full credit. Um, there's nothing wrong with this. So I highly suggest that you use this WVU EBSCO host site feature, but also make sure that you go in and you um, make the changes that you need to make. Let me show you an example, uh, a bad example of something that someone turned in last or last year in this class. So right off the bat, and this is going to get you low credit in. Um, if you would turn this in, because for this next assignment, assignment number three, you have to make references uh, for the three articles that you cited or that you talked about in assignment number one. So right off the bat, this is just, I mean, every citation is just different from each other. Um, to me, this is like, it's really low effort. One of the things that how I grade your future assignments from here on out is effort. If you put effort in, even if it's something that's wrong, um, you, know, you put in good effort, you'll get, you'll get some points for it. For this, every single citation is wrong. It's clear that you know this person didn't even look at it. There's so I mean, there's so many things wrong with it. Um, none of these are in APA format. Like the all of this is capitalized, shouldn't be capitalized. No date. I'm not even gonna go through all. There's, it, literally everything is wrong um, with these citations. Please don't do this. Um, you will not get points. You will not get full points or even like half points for something that's submitted like that. So please make sure you're using this APA seven thing through EBSCO host. Or if you're not using EBSCO host, you know, make sure you go back to this PowerPoint and you, um, you know, you look at these citations and you have all the correct things that you need. All right, we have 15 minutes. I, we can come back to these, um, but I'm gonna talk about assignment number three. So assignment number three is actually three parts and it shouldn't take you that long, um, but let me go ahead and pull up the assignment. Which you can see. All right. So part A is going to be completing WVU's plagiarism avoidance tutorial. 
Um, there is more instructions, which I'll pull up in this, the actual assignment sheet. If you've done this within the past year um, and you have the, or actually, no, I think this is the one that, yeah, this is the one that you have to take. So no matter what, everyone has to take this one, even if you've taken it before. All right, so part A, you have all, everyone has to do. Part B, you have to do as well. Um, this is where you're gonna write examples of in-text citations for each of your articles that you did in assignment one uh, for your article review. And you're also gonna create a reference page with your three articles. Um, there, I'll show it after I talk about part C. Part C, if you've already done this and you have the certificate, you don't need to do it again. Don't look at this, don't look at this due date. This was from fall semester. Um, but what you need to do is complete the IRB uh, research ethics training on the homework assignment, there is a step-by-step uh, -step instructions of what exactly you need to do. Uh, and this is not due on September 27th. This is due uh, this coming Monday. It really won't take you that long. But let me show you the actual homework assignment. Yeah, so this is the actual homework assignment. It gives you step-by-step -step instructions of what to do um, for each of these parts. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go over this just because it is step by step. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, if you've already done this ethics IRB training, I know someone already sent me an email saying like, hey, you don't have to do it again. Uh, no, you do not have to do it again. So if you've already done it, re, re download the completion report that it gives you and then upload it to eCampus um, following these instructions. So yeah, plagiarism of Williams tutorial, create references for your three articles and a reference page, and it gives you an example of what it looks like. So we, what we want to see is, you know, an actual reference page with your three sources, as well as in-text citations, um, you know, so the front of the sentence and the end of sentence. And then you need to do uh, the ethics IRB training if you have not done it already. Any questions about assignment number three? Pretty straightforward. Look at these instructions step by step. Um, and, yeah, and you'll be fine. All right. Um, cool. 